Hello everyone, Dr Peter Stapleton here, Clinical and Health Psychologist and Associate Professor at Bonn University here in Australia. Wanted to give you an update on all of the research in the EFT, Emotional Freedom Techniques, commonly known as tapping, field over the last 12 to 18 months. So I like to do these just so that you can see where the field's at. Perhaps you'd like to share this with somebody out there in your world or even workplace uh, and just to keep people abreast of actually what is happening. And probably the most exciting thing is that we have discovered in the last uh, 12 to 18 months that many studies are actually being published in non-English speaking journals uh, well more than what we realised in countries such as Korea, Iraq and Iran, uh, even countries such as India, where they're actually running clinical research trials in tapping and publishing those in academic journals as well. So some exciting things uh, yet to be translated and to come out. But just to give you an update of perhaps where we're at, particularly because some of the acceptance of EFT has actually been emerging and just becoming more solid, um, not only in our country here in Australia, but worldwide as well. So I actually have notes because there's so much to actually share with you of what's actually been happening. So some research that has come out that has been new in the field. And of course, if anybody does want any of these papers, I can absolutely share those. So just reach out. But we had a randomised clinical trial, which is the gold standard in research. So it is where people perhaps self-select to a trial, but then are randomly allocated either into the intervention, so the EFT in this case, or a control group or perhaps another type of treatment. And none of that is influenced by choice. So typically done by a computer randomisation program. This one was done in Iran that actually looked at 88 women that actually were suffering mild to moderate depression, but also going through the menopause process. So anyone that might be able to relate to that time in life. So randomly allocated 44 into tapping and 44 into the sham group. So this is actually a study that's actually looked at not tapping on known acupressure points from acupuncture, what we would call a sham point, and obviously there to have a look at the difference of whether or not it is just the tapping on any part of the body that might produce the effect. So we had 44 allocated. The EFT group obviously received that for eight weeks and the sham group received just a similar EFT uh, tapping intervention, but on sham points, not acupuncture points. So after that eight week intervention, they actually found that the moderate depression decreased to 9%. So it went from 56% to 9% in the EFT group, so the group that got the traditional known um, clinical EFT, and from 50% to 30% in the control group that got the sham tapping. So basically what it actually showed was the group that got the tapping on the known acupuncture points actually had the most significant effect on that reduction of depression um, in that menopause uh, sort of space, and obviously at a statistical level did significantly better than the sham tapping. A study which I am pleased to share because not only does it come out of Australia, but it's one of the first studies that's actually looked at uh, at a clinical level in a, in a trial, EFT application in primary school children. So whilst lots of practitioners might actually use that with younger children, we don't really have a lot of published trials in that. So Dr. Margaret Lambert actually did this for her PhD research and actually had a look at, and it is called the Tapping Project. Uh, and of course, you can actually have access to this as well, where it had a look at applying tapping in classrooms in four Northern Territory classrooms, so schools that were primary schools, just to support emotional well-being and social well-being, that type of thing. And of course, as a mechanism for change, if perhaps, you know, academic things were needed uh, to be focused on that kind of thing. She also looked at whether or not the students and teachers found it acceptable, and of course they did, and students were more likely, the results showed, to develop internal motivation for tapping when they were tapping on things to do with competency, autonomy, autonomy, and relating to other peers. So some wonderful things coming out. It's quite an extensive PhD dissertation. If you would like to have a look at that, it is in the public space to have a read of. A couple of other studies that have come out, which I know has been exciting to share on social media because many women working in this space, but tapping being compared to just breathing awareness for the labor process. And what I mean by that is childbirth labor. So one study actually had a look at childbirth 
fear. So certainly lots of things coming out of the post-traumatic trauma space in terms of that birthing process, not only for mum, but perhaps that child when they grow up. So I've actually had a look at tapping versus breathing awareness versus a group that didn't get any intervention and just went through that normal birthing process. Uh, so they were actually offered their breathing awareness or their tapping in three different phases of labour. So the latent phase, the active phase and the transition phase. So the groups were the same as far as demographics and they had a look at obviously their own self-related uh, reported levels of distress, that kind of thing. So they actually found that tapping and breathing awareness were both beneficial, but the tapping was more effective and it was more permanent. So it actually lasted a lot longer. So that's exciting. We have had some other research coming out in that labour space as well, which was really, really great. And of course, the question that is often asked uh, sometimes in tapping is, can you imagine tapping on the pressure points and still get an outcome? Do you physically have to do tapping on that acupuncture point? And of course, that's a really interesting question, particularly if someone has chronic pain or fibromyalgia, where it might actually be quite tender and sore and also has applications if, you know, at night you have uh, insomnia affecting your sleep quality and you don't necessarily want to pick your hand up and do active tapping. Can imagining or uh, tapping on those points in your mind still work? And we've had the first fMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging Study, come out of Germany that's actually shown, and they actually did this by activating a feeling in the participants inside that MRI machine, where they showed them imagery of something that created a fear response or a disgust response or a neutral response. So images around that and showed them in the MRI so that they could watch them. They were able to watch a film to cultivate those feelings if they needed to prior. They taught them 16 different tapping points, so just 16 different points to tap on, but then said to them, when you're in the machine seeing random images be presented and you cultivate the feeling, fear, disgust, or a neutral one, then just choose several of those points, um, just choose three of them and imagine tapping on them. So they're obviously inside the machine, can't move inside there for any of that noise and imagine tapping on, just pick three of the ones that you remember that perhaps felt, felt good to you. Of course, they were able to look at the brain and what it did and found that the active ingredient of tapping in this trial, because there was nothing else that they I learned about the technique itself or any words to say, so it actually didn't say any words. They just focused in on the feeling that the image they were looking at kind of brought up and then imagined tapping and, of course, showed that the tapping actually indeed activated the brain, deactivated activity in the amygdala, and they were able to obviously make themselves feel better or calmer, and they could see it on the brain scan. So a fantastic study that has actually confirmed a lot of what we actually know. It came across our, our desk this year that the Blue Knot Foundation here in Australia is a trauma-based organisation that supports uh, people that have had trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, they have actually included EFT tapping in their clinical guidelines for clinicians treating anything to do with trauma or PTSD. So that was very exciting to see that that was actually listed. Tapping has also been approved here in Australia under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So particularly for patients who self-manage their own plans, uh, tapping is actually covered. So if you're in Australia and can access that or do know patients that are self-managed plans under that system, actually approve tapping. We've also seen, uh, which is very exciting, two papers come out of the UK in the last 12 months. Now these were major reviews that were actually done of different treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. One of them was actually having a look at whether or not things such as uh, EMDR, the eye movement desensitization therapy, uh, things like trauma-focused CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then a category of combined somatic cognitive therapies of which energy psychology, EFT tapping, was included. And have a look at how effective are they for the treatment of PTSD. And then a second paper actually looked at what is the most cost effective or has the most cost savings. So excited to announce that the um, 
category of somatic cognitive therapies, of which energy psychology was under, was the second most effective at reducing PTSD symptomology, and second to EMDR, which of course is another therapy that we do include in that uh, fourth wave somatic-based approaches anyway. So that was very exciting. And then probably even more so is that the study that came out of that, that looked at cost savings and cost effectiveness, actually showed that uh, so combined somatic uh, cognitive therapies, energy psychology included, had the most cost effective savings in treatment to obviously achieve its outcomes. And the second one there being EMDR, but tapping definitely being the most cost effective. So very exciting for us to see those kind of outcomes um, and particularly, you know, obviously cost savings in those therapy spaces where participants, patients do need to pay to access therapy, that sort of thing, to see some of these obviously very rapid and, um, you know, well-researched and now approaches having a really big impact. So excited to kind of give you those updates of where the field is at. Of course, we have seen many other papers that have been published in the last 12 to 18 months. I'd encourage you to sort of have a look and research some of those if you would like to actually see some of those outcomes. They're just some of the highlights. We'll be keen to share with you. Uh, we have just finished a chronic pain worldwide tapping trial here through Bond University. So we actually have been able to have a look at two different different deliveries of that. One being live facilitator-led sessions that were delivered online, and the other one being a self-paced version. So a self-paced uh, set of videos where people were able to put themselves through those. They did have contact to myself, um, but to compare those two elements. So we have been able to have a look at the preliminary data for those, and I can tell you that the self-paced version has done slightly better than the live versions to date. We are analysing the rest of the data at the moment, but at least gives us confidence that a well-designed self-paced tapping program can actually achieve the same outcomes. Part of that study has included MRI scanning, so we have been able to do that on a subset. And in addition to that, we have actually been investigating the vagal nerve activity in patients with chronic pain to see if tapping actually impacts that. Now, that has been a partnership with Dr. Stephen Porges' team from Indiana University in the US, and they sent us the machines to be able to measure that vagal nerve activity and efficiency. And of course, they are currently analysing that data for us as well. So we do look forward to sharing some of those outcomes, not only at the MRI level, but also the uh, vagal nerve activity as part as polyvagal theory goes. So lots of things coming up for us here in Australia over the next 12 to 18 months moving forward. I'm keen to share some of those things with you next year. And I hope that maybe this has given you a bit of an update of where the field's at and how you might be able to use that in your own life. Stay open, everybody. I look forward to seeing you again soon.